My uh, work <clears throat> over more than 10 years now has been mostly with uh, Tsimsian people, mostly in British Columbia, but also in Alaska as well. Uh, so that'll be a little bit of the focus of what I'm doing here, but there will also be a lot of relevance for people doing uh, or interested in Clinkett uh, research and Haida research on genealogy and family history in both British Columbia and Alaska, because each of those three nations has a presence um, uh, on, on both and has communities on both sides of the uh, uh, international border. Uh, I want to just give a little uh, background because I get this question of a lot when I work in communities, uh, why it is and how it is that I got uh, involved in genealogy research. Because on the face of it, it seems kind of strange. Here I am, I, I don't have First Nations or Native ancestry, and I'm spending all this time documenting this, and it seems like a strange motivation. Uh, my training is in anthropology originally, <clears throat> and I was lucky when I was an undergraduate in Oregon earning my bachelor's degree that I uh, acquired as mentors <clears throat> a uh, husband-wife anthropologist team, David and Catherine French, uh, who are both deceased now, who uh, uh, took me under their wing to a great extent, and they were involved <clears throat> in a very personal and very long-term way with the communities at and around the Warm Springs Indian Reservation on the Mid-Columbia River in Oregon. And I sort of saw firsthand the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of engagement with that community that became central to their careers as anthropologists. They actually were involved with that community from 1949 uh, uh, right up until Catherine French's death just last year. And so I was able to sort of uh, help them on, on, on dictionary projects, because I, I have a strong interest in linguistics too, uh, indexing newspaper obituaries for purposes of genealogy, and their home, which they worked out of, was a place where uh, native people and colleagues were in and out of there all the time, and when something happened, in the Warm Springs community, they were right there, they hopped in their car, they, they, they had a sort of long-term, very personal involvement with the community. And my uh, reaction to this was sort of, you know, this is the life. Uh, you know, what would, uh, uh, that's, that's <clears throat> what anthropology is or should be all about. And uh, I went on to graduate school at the University of Chicago and uh, my interests moved a little bit from linguistics into other areas such as kinship, which is the anthropological study of family systems, and uh, uh, social structure, which includes all kinds of things such as the different kinds of clan systems that there are in the world, and the different kinds of what anthropologists call exchange systems, because the potlatch, which is really uh, uh, not so much a native term as an, as, an as an anthropological term that covers so many different kinds of things is a huge issue that most people who study anthropology are exposed to. And that's, and, and what it refers to, and it's known locally up and down the northwest coast by so many different names and in interior areas as well, is, uh, 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 is wherever you find it very central to uh, <coughs> uh, to all sorts of aspects of the culture and of the society. And in particular, I became interested in the phenomenon of personal naming practices, hereditary names, as people often say here, or clan names, or uh, uh, feast names. The traditional naming system, which is also so much centered on uh, uh, the potlatch, or the feast, or, or um, uh, it's, it, it's funny, up here, people use the word parties a lot, and I don't hear that, that, that word farther south, but it's really, it's other words for the same uh, larger phenomenon. Uh, hereditary names that belong to a clan, uh, I, I became interested in the ways in which understanding that system of how names are passed on and what that means brings in uh, uh, so many different things. In so many ways, it's at the center of uh, uh, the cultures of this area. It brings in the exchange of wealth and privileges and respect and recognition between the clans. It brings in the language, the names af are, are after all our language. It brings in uh, 
uh, history because names come from uh, 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 histories. Tsimsian people tell me that every name has a story behind it. We don't always know the name. It hasn't always been recorded. Sometimes their holders don't know the story, but there is a story, and that's where the names come from. And the names also are connected so much to uh, uh, spiritual practices and to the spiritual concepts of what it is that makes a person. And, 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 and so it's at the center of so many things. And as I was uh, uh, immersing myself in many of these I ideas and understandings just purely in library research. One of these uh, serendipities or synchronicities occurred that the Tsimsian Tribal Council was at that time looking for someone to uh, kickstart uh, a genealogy project that would cover the Tsimsian nation. The Tsimsian Tribal Council uh, at that point, and this is the uh, around 1994, uh, did not and never really did have a, a formal uh, relationship with Metlakatla, Alaska. Only, only sort of a, only sort of a, sort of a symbolic one. But it was um, uh, from the early 1990s until just uh, a couple years ago, when it uh, ceased to exist for various reasons. It was the political voice for the uh, seven Tsimsian communities in British Columbia. And uh, at that point, the Tsimsian Tribal Council uh, operated under a mandate from the hereditary chiefs of all of the Tsimsian communities as a whole. And so that was the, uh, and, and so it was that mandate from the hereditary chiefs which asked for uh, a genealogy project. Uh, and for so many reasons, uh, uh, the most overt reason uh, uh, or, the, or let's say the most, the most obvious reason was because that was around the time, the early 1990s, when uh, land claims uh, began to be an issue that all of the First Nations of BC were involved in in a very uh, direct way. And for those of you who just, who, who've come in since I began, welcome. And there are handouts at the back. There's uh, uh, one, there's a single eight and a half by eleven sheet, and there's a and there's a, a small smaller blue brochure as well. Um, the situation in British Columbia is a little different from the situation it is, uh, uh, as you find it in Alaska, with respect to uh, uh, indigenous land rights. Um, uh, there has never been anything like uh, the treaties that you find in the Lower Forty Eight. Uh, there has never even been anything like the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And British Columbia is one of the few areas that has been colonized by uh, 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 Britain or one of the few parts of the English-speaking world where there have been, and there are a couple exceptions, sm small areas of British Columbia, but there have essentially been no treaties. Um, so it's a very uh, curious legal situation where as far as the law is concerned, and especially a very important document called the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where King George III, I think it was, said, if you haven't got a treaty, it's still Indian land. And uh, a lot of courts try to ignore that. A lot of jurisdictions do their best to pretend that that Royal Proclamation isn't there. Canada has a legal system which is still very much an extension of the British legal system. So that has royal proclamations still have force in, uh, 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 in Canada. So you have a situation where the entire province of British Columbia, and this became the secret that the government didn't want you to know, isn't really part of Canada because there were never any treaties. And this uh, dirty secret, uh, dirty from the perspective of the government, uh, came out of uh, uh, came out of hiding in the late 1980s when two First Nations, the Gitxan Nation and the Wet'suwet'en Nation, uh, joined together to try to uh, sue in provincial court for uh, provincial and federal recognition uh, of their ownership, not just rights to use, not just rights to be there, not just certain rights, but out and out ownership of their traditional territories. And they had an entire team of 
anthropologists, geographers, linguists, other scholars that were involved in this effort of documenting that ownership. And also, it was at a, it was at, at a, at a point in history where there were uh, uh, hereditary chiefs for each of the landholding units of those two nations who were able and willing to testify in court in detail uh, uh, about that ownership. Um, and this is also a particular, uh, and these, these two First Nations, like the Tlingit Nation, like the Haida Nation, like the Tsimsia Nation, had and have forms of land ownership that uh, uh, are recognizable to the European culture as being uh, very much like the kind of land ownership that you find tr from traditional European culture. Very many significant differences too, but the idea that it's not just land use, it's land ownership, and that the owners of the land uh, of particular territories are the house groups, uh, the extended matrilineal families. Uh, that's something that the courts could understand. A little bit of cultural translation was needed, but the concept of ownership. And so this uh, uh, scared the you-know-what out of the British Columbian government. The uh, 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 court case was decided in the Crown's favor, um, but there was a partial overturning in the, in the Canadian Supreme Court later on. But what this meant was the British Columbian government panicked, and they said, if all the First Nations in British Columbia start to bring suits like this, eventually we're going to get a judge who's not as racist as this one was, and then it's going to be it's it's going to blow everything wide open, you know, and it'll challenge the very existence of Canadian sovereignty in that area. So they launched a land claims uh, uh, process under the British Columbia Treaty Commission, uh, and this uh, uh, right in 1992, 1993 was a period when suddenly all sorts of political will and motivation and funds became available for all the different First Nations of British Columbia to begin documenting their presence and their use of the land and their land ownership. And that's the context in which the uh, Tsimsian Tribal Council was looking for someone to do genealogy research because genealogy research, um, and it has many applications which I'll go through, but the, but the initial application here was if uh, uh, there in, 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 a, in, a, in a legal context, whether it's in court or whether it's at a political negotiations at a treaty table, you ca if you're going to negotiate or litigate for uh, territorial rights, then the question has to be answered, well, who is this group of people that's uh, uh, asking for these rights to be recognized? Is it everybody that's in the town? Uh, is it, uh, are there subgroups of people within the community that are asking for rights? Is it just the chiefs or is it just the chiefs' families or is it everybody? And this question needs to be answered because in every court case, if you're going to have um, uh, the people bringing the suit, the question is who's bringing the suit? In the Gitxan case, it was the hereditary chiefs that were named as the uh, 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 people bringing the suit, as the entities bringing the suit. And these uh, uh, hereditary chiefs embodied, and 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 their, the, the 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 positions that they represented uh, embodied the matrilineal families that they represented. And one of the amazing things about the Gitxan case is that the suit was not brought by uh, people named things like uh, Albert Tate and Solomon Marsden, and you know just you know the English names. It was the hereditary names that were the uh, uh, plaintiffs. And hereditary names are not the same thing as English names. When you use an English name to refer to a person, you're doing something different than when you're using a traditional hereditary name to refer to a person, because a traditional hereditary name doesn't refer to a single person with a birth date and a death date. It refers to uh, a position in the society and, uh, and a set of rights and obligations that is immortal and that goes back to time immemorial and will continue for time immemorial. So it's not just, you know, Joe Schmo bringing the case. It is, in the case of the Kixan case, Delgamuk. And, all the, and Delgamuk is an ancient uh, entity which transcends the life of a single person. That made, and that was the argument that was made in court, and that made it a very powerful 
very powerful kind of statement. So a key part of their evidence was a genealogy project which said, well, if these hereditary names are the, are, are, are the plaintiffs, and if the hereditary names that are chief names represent, and in a sense, are the embodiment of extended families, then we also need to document who these extended families are, because these are the larger body of plaintiffs that are involved in this. And that's a question that's too often kind of uh, uh, glided over in many kinds of treaty negotiations. And sometimes it comes under the heading of membership policy. Well, if a certain entity, uh, tribal entity, traditional entity, is going to have these rights, then who belongs to this entity, and how do you decide who belongs to this entity? And uh, that question gets answered in many different ways in different political and legal contexts. Uh, uh, even, there are even differences among uh, First Nations and, and, and Native Nations that have, that have very similar uh, 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 systems. So I want to... Uh, there are handouts at the back, but I also have a, a transparency for uh, uh, that have the same information as the handouts. You'll see that I am I am an old-fashioned guy. Everybody's using PowerPoint this weekend, and here I am with an overhead projector. As soon as I'm done with this, they're going to take this off to the museum because it's the last overhead projector uh, uh, in existence in, in in the United States of America. Uh, <clears throat> But they work, knock on wood. I don't think we'll have any technical problems. Uh, let me see. So you'll see there I list some of the, is that all fine with the light? Uh, or would the, would the light be better off? Are we okay? <clears throat> there we go. And I've listed just a few of the possible uh, uh, applications and benefits of a genealogy project. And here, enrollment and membership policy, especially in the case of, uh, uh, of land claims negotiations or of litigation for land rights. And both of those are methods um, uh, uh, of securing land rights that are in use by different, by different First Nations in, in, in British Columbia. And even uh, uh, nations and tribal groups that do have a, a, a land rights agreement in place. Many of them still, even though the uh, uh, politically uh, and legally the situation might be settled, there is still need for an ongoing uh, updating of the sense of who it is that belongs to this organization, whether it's a, uh, uh, an ANCSA corporation or a tribal council or a band uh, so, so, so whatever the entity on either side of the uh, uh, BC Alaska border, and repatriation. After working for uh, uh, many years with the uh, Tsimshian in BC and and in Alaska, uh, in two in 2003 to 04, I I did a project with for the Cape Fox Corporation, a genealogy project that attempted to cover all of the uh, Sanya Kwan and Tanta Kwan uh, uh, people. Uh, and I had already had a little bit of a head start uh, because there is so much intermarriage between those two Kwans and the community of Metlakatla, Alaska, which I had already done uh, quite a bit of work uh, documenting uh, uh, family histories for. And I should mention that uh, 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 two people who have been crucial to uh, uh, the genealogy in that area, uh, Mary and Willard Jones, uh, uh, and I've worked with them uh, very early. She is Clinkett with Tsimshian ancestry. He is Haida, um, and, and, and in, in many ways they are kind of at the uh, uh, center of genealogy research in the, in the Ketchikan, Metlakatla area. They were supposed to be uh, here they registered and had their uh, tickets and everything, but um, a, a, a health crisis emerged. If you know Willard and Mary, they're fine. They're going to be fine, but uh, uh, it was just bad timing and their health comes, fir and their health comes first. So uh, they're here in spirit, but I wanted, to, I wanted to recognize all the work that they uh, 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 facilitated. And uh, so that Irene just, come in, just, just came in and she 
uh, got to hear that. Irene was, Irene was the person at uh, Cape Fox Corporation that I worked with most closely during that, during that project. And in so many ways, it was an extension of my work with the Tsimsian Genealogy Project. Because one thing, and anyone here who has done genealogy research, whether uh, professionally or vocationally as a hobby, one thing you find is you can't contain it. Uh, before you know it, you, it's, it's spreading all over. Even if you just study your own ancestry, suddenly it's, 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 uh, the, the, the project begins to leak into all communities. And so I, and so I, uh, 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 um, and, and because there's so much intermarriage between Metlakatla Alaska people and Tlingit people, um, I ended up having to get, I, I had already been getting kind of a, a, a quick education in, in, in uh, uh, Clinket clan systems and, uh, and, and, and Clinket histories. So we can say, and repatriation was the um, uh, underlying rationale for my work for the Cape Fox Corporation. And this is especially true, this is not true for every uh, American Indian, Native American group in the United States, but this is especially true for this area where you have a clan system and where you have so many important objects that belong to particular lineages and clans. That's not true in every uh, First Nation or Native group, but it's true in the ones in this region. So that when objects are repatriated, uh, uh, these are objects that are not just owned by communities or owned by ethnic groups, they are owned by specific families, and these specific families have specific leadership structures that are still in place. So you can't just say, yeah, all that stuff came from here, so just kind of send it all over. Um, well, um, uh, sometimes it does work out that way in various parts of the United States, and sometimes that makes sense because of what the local culture is. Up here, and much credit to Irene, who, who pays very uh, uh, close attention to the protocols, you can't just do that because these objects do and did and always have belonged to specific families and they have to be involved and if they're going to be repatriated the question has to be repatriated to whom um, and, and, and those of you who were here uh, time begins to blur but I think that was last night wasn't it when, when a lot of those adu from the uh, were brought out that is a, 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 a living example of the importance, not just of repatriating some of these artifacts, which are living things, um, but the importance of knowing whose uh, uh, objects they are. So that is a, a, a very important application of genealogical research. Also, traditional lineage politics and social structure, name giving, maintenance of houses, candidates for chieftainships, treaty negotiations. Here you get something that's sort of below, or you might even say above the policy level. This is not something that always gets sorted out through tribal councils or through native corporations, but this is something that has an application for the traditional political structures in communities. And one of the things that I've been most proud of in this research, and it also is a little bit frightening because then you really need to have confidence in the research that you're putting together, is when people, uh, when uh, traditional political groupings like houses, and the Tsimsian have houses just like the Clinket do. Uh, the system is very similar in many respects. So the matrilineal extended families that have ownership rights are called houses, as they are here. Uh, if a house is in a situation where they need to resolve something, for example, uh, a, communi a, a house seems to be running out of members. There are no new members to the house. But someone seems to think that there might be members of the house that live in other communities, or maybe live down in Vancouver or Seattle. Uh, it becomes important to know who those people are and to involve them. Maybe one of those people is willing to move back and take on a leadership position because no one in the community is left to do it. Or a house is getting too large. Um, um, and I know this phenomenon is also part of Clinket uh, lineage structures too. Sometimes a house, is so large that there aren't enough names for the people that it becomes unmanageable as a political unit. So uh, uh, what needs to be done is for it to uh, split off into subsidiary houses, maybe for a long time, maybe just for a little while. Uh, sometimes it be becomes necessary to look at a genealogy chart to figure out, well, how are we going to divide it up then? Uh, which branch becomes which newly named house or subhouse? And these are questions that come up all the time in traditional lineage politics, or who should get a name. Sometimes <clears throat> uh, 
uh, uh, the family connections go back so far that people start wondering, well, which branch of the family is from the older of these three sisters? And sometimes you'll find different opinions from different members of the community. Uh, very often this takes the form of people thinking that their own ancestress was the oldest of the uh, uh, whatever number of sisters. And sometimes genealogy research can resolve that uh, and, and, and can help answer it and provide a set of information that everyone can look at to try to, to, try to resolve these things. Um, uh, uh, so, so things like that. And child welfare cases, this is also, uh, this doesn't come up necessarily very often but it's very powerful when it does. Especially, and I know that child welfare cases are, are a big concern in British Columbia and in uh, uh, Alaska and in the lower 48. Many native communities are in situations where uh, 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 children are adopted out or are fostered out. And when that happens, there are certain things that can be done on behalf of those children such as making sure that they're placed with uh, 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 a native family rather than a white family, if that's, if, if that's what's preferred. And, there are situa and, 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 and in, in many jurisdictions, there are a whole set of uh, uh, rights that children have um, that require legal demonstration proof that that person does have ancestry in a particular native community. And I, 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 I of course, won't go into any, any details of cases, but some of the most gratifying uh, 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 moments in this genealogical research have been ones where, for example, I'm thinking of one particular instance where there was a child that was in the uh, foster care system and people were trying to decide, lawyers and social workers were, and, 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 ju and a judge was trying to decide, should this child be placed with a white family because this person had an a ancestry in a Native American community and no one could really prove it. So um, uh, I got a phone call and I worked with the social worker in the village community trying to get documents, faxing stuff back and forth, and it came so close that I was emailing someone in the village community she was faxing stuff to the social worker who was in touch by cell phone driving across Washington State towards Spokane for a court hearing, had to pull in and find a Kinko's where she could get the fax with this documentation and showed up in court just in time with demonstration that this kid had native ancestry and should be placed with, uh, and, and should be placed with native relatives rather than just go into uh, a foster care system. You know, and that's, and that's a really, very, very powerful kind of use for this uh, uh, information. Uh, and it doesn't come up that often, but uh, uh, when it does, it's, it's very key. Land tenure and land use, and that's sort of connected to the, to, to the land claims case for the Gitxan and so on, because when land use and resource use is based on which is based on a system in which certain families have rights to certain resources, and I know that's how it works, uh, uh, up here, it's important then when you're arguing for rights to resources and fighting for rights to resources to um, uh, be able to know who is who are the members of this particular family, this particular house or clan that you're talking about. Uh, reconnecting diaspora and village communities. I know this is true with the Timsian in BC and uh, uh, Metlakatla, and it's true with uh, in many Clinket communities I know too, and Haida communities where you have many people who are of ancestry of these nations who live in places like Prince George and uh, Vancouver and Seattle and places even farther afield. I've been in touch with people in Florida and uh, uh, Japan and people don't know, people might know I'm Haida or I'm Timsian or I'm Clinket and I have a vague idea of what village that's from but people want to know more and they uh, 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 and, 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 and some of those uh, individuals have such a hunger for information, uh, such a need to put uh, uh, faces and bodies of knowledge to this phrase that's sort of been rumored in the family, you're Tsimsian, did you know that? You know, what does that even mean? And some of those people have such a hunger for information and it can be incredibly powerful for them to be able to uh, uh, reconnect not just 
this is the lineage you belong to, this is who your chief is, but here are some people that you can be introduced to who are your, who are your relatives. You know, and, this, you know, and, 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 that can be, and that can be a very powerful experience too. And to see that displayed on a genealogy chart, you know, to, to, to see the actual connection, to see this branch of the family o over here, which has been living in Washington State for a few generations now, and, and, and where there might, not be, there might be very little knowledge, and then to see connection through a grandmother and her sisters, and then this other branch of the family living in the village community, all of whom might have hereditary names. Just, ju just the visual representation of that is sometimes e extremely powerful to, to people, and people within the native communities too, um, uh, uh, have a hunger too to know who it is that's out there in the wider world uh, uh, that belongs in a very real sense to those communities. So, so that, and that's, and that's very much connected with the uh, last bullet point there, general knowledge, self-esteem, quality of life, whatever you want to call it, some of these very abstract benefits, spiritual benefits that come from knowing who you are. Um, uh, many of you um, uh, uh, in this room who, who, who have grown up in village communities where the culture is very strong and where the sense of, of what the groups are and what the, and, 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 and what the clans represent is very strong um, uh, um, are, 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 are very lo lucky and honored to have that. Uh, many other communities and many other uh, uh, people living in the diaspora, which just means people living far away from where they come from, um, uh, 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 might not have that continual spiritual sustenance from sort of knowing who you are and having the support of, uh, 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 of other clans in the community. And so that can become a really powerful thing. And it, I, even I found for people who, who never, you know, make it up uh, uh, to this part of the world from where they've become dispersed, just to know, you know, oh, I'm from the house of so-and-so. That can be such a powerful thing, you know, and especially for young people who might have uh, an abstract idea of, of, of native pride, but not really knowing what that means and to be able to put a name to that. And for people living in uh, urban native communities to be able to go into uh, a ceremonial situation and not just say, I've heard that I belong to such and such a group, but be able to say, you know, I am a, I am a member of the house of so-and-so, you know, and that's, and, that, and, that, and that's a very powerful thing. It's, 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 it's uh, um, and that's been one of the great things to see with this genealogy project, to be able to enable people to achieve that. So that is um, uh, 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 some of the benefits. Um, and in particular, for the native uh, uh, peoples, the First Nations communities of this area, I switch back and forth sometimes before what's the, mo the, 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 the currently preferred terms in, in BC and Alaska. Um, uh, especially for this part of the world, and especially for the Tsimsian, Clinket, and Haida nations, you have one important principle that unites uh, these nations, and also ones farther south, and also ones in the interior, and that's the matrilineal principle. And that's the idea that the clan that you belong to, the house that you belong to, uh, uh, depends on the uh, group affiliation uh, of your mother. And that's not the way it works in every uh, native group. Uh, that's not the way it works in every tribal society. But here at the northwestern part of North America, there's a very, uh, there's a very solid area, which we're right in the middle of here, where you find uh, matrilineal groups for, for, for quite a ways in any direction, except if you go uh, uh, far north. That's when you start to encounter different systems. The Eskimo system is, 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 is different. As soon as you get to the central British Columbia coast, you encounter systems that are slightly different, but we're in the middle of a big matrilineal area right now. And so this is the, the one respect in which there is a very key difference between different kinds of genealogy research. Many uh, people from matrilineal societies, such as the, the uh, Haida, Clinket, and Simsian, who decide that they want to embark on a journey of genealogical research, Sometimes the first thing they do is they go on the internet or they go to the computer store and they say, I want to get something that does genealogy and they'll get something like Family Tree Maker or they'll go to Ancestry.com and then, <clears throat> you know, and in our, you know, the wider dominant society tells us, you know, technology fixes everything. You know, there's a, there's a computer program for everything. 
uh, there's a website for everything. And sometimes the first thing that happens is a lot of frustration because these genealogy programs, something like Family Tree Maker, which has its values, it is not oriented to the way that matrilineal societies work at all. And so sometimes it's very frustrating. People use them and they find it, many people find it a very useful way to organize information. Uh, as far as databases go, Jedit.com is another example of this. Very useful. But when you're thinking about the end product, uh, then you run into certain problems. Because you have a, data, you have a database, a, a way to store data. But then what does everyone want to do with a database? You want to be able to print something out so that you can look at the family and start tracing the important connections. Now, so here you have the question of graphic representation. You might have a database with all the information you need in it, but how are you going to represent it in two dimensions? Um, that's a big problem. And there are two ways to solve this in traditional off-the-shelf genealogy, or let's say genealogy from the dominant culture or from white culture. Uh, if you try to show everybody that's related to you or everybody that's related to a certain community on one piece of paper, you're going to run into problems. Lines start having to cross each other, and especially if people are related to each other in two different ways, then you have crisscrossing lines all over the paper. This is something that happens very fast uh, uh, or very early on in the process of trying to represent genealogy. Judith Berman, my colleague there, has, has grappled with that and has, has done a very good job grappling with that. And it works better if you have a finite set of data that you're working with, um, such as, for example, if, any, if anyone caught her presentation of working with just, let's say, the information that George McKay recorded at a certain point in time, you know that that body of data isn't going to get any larger. So once you have to learn to, w once you meet the challenges of graphing it out, then you, then, then you can sort of move on to something else later. But in a genealogy project that grows, then you're going to run into problems very quickly. So traditional, let's say, white Euro-American genealogy has come up with the two ways of doing it. And here's one way to think about it. First, you have everyone who's descended from one ancestor, and that starts to look like a pyramid, where you have the ancestor at the top, then the next generation, and it gets slightly larger at each generation. That's a pyramid. Well, that's very useful. Sometimes that's exactly the kind of information that someone wants to know. For historians' purposes, who are the descendants of George Washington? You know, And maybe you don't care who else these people are descended from. You just want to answer that question, who are the descendants of George Washington? That's a great format for that. Or the other way to do it, and this is what most hobby genealogy programs are oriented towards, who are one person's ancestors. Many genealogy uh, uh, people who begin they want to find out who are my ancestors, and uh, not too interested in who the ancestors of the people across the street are, um, or, 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 or one's own in-laws. And that's an upside-down pyramid, where you have you at the bottom, and then your parents and great grand and that's a very nicely formed pyramid because not everyone has the same amount of kids, but everyone's got the same amount of parents, grandparents, and so on. It's just a, um, a, a, a times two progression. But, and those are, are sometimes very important kinds of information if that's what you're looking for. But when you're looking at something like a clan or a house, a Tsimsian clinket or a, a, a house or a Haida lineage, um, you don't want an upside down pyramid, you don't want a pyramid, you want something that is represented a different way. Because not everyone that's descended from, let's say, a particular ancestress or clan mother is a member of that clan, because the men's children are members of some other clan. They're a member of whoever their mother's clan uh, 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 was. So here I'm going to show you an example. This is from the uh, Gitxan project that I was talking about. Uh, and this is sort of what it, what it looks like. Where you have at the top there, you'll see there are two sisters. One of them and even her daughter are of unknown name. Uh, in, this, in this system, uh, uh, the circles are females and the uh, uh, triangles are males. And uh, uh, it's possible to make all, sort of, all sorts of jokes about the origins of that. Uh, 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 system of representation, but it's one that's used by anthropologists. And again, um, um, uh, a lot of uh, programs like Family Tree Maker can't handle this. Uh, uh, so, and then each of their descendants, and watch what happens where 
you have, for example, uh, the daughters represented coming off of a line, the circles. Their children are shown, but the triangles, the sons, their children are not shown. They're on another chart because this chart only shows this particular house. This chart is from the Gitxan genealogy project that I was talking about. And I'm using this particular one because it's been made public information because it was used with permission of this particular Gitxan house to be reproduced in Heather Harris's uh, master's thesis. Heather Harris is the person uh, who, who, who later became a, uh, a professor at the University of Northern British Columbia. She's Métis and she uh, uh, married into the Gitxan and she helped develop this kind of matrilineal format and the Tsimsian genealogy and all the work that I've done with matrilineal peoples has been based on this format. So people who uh, people who live in traditional village communities are already thinking matrilineally all the time. It's very interesting to see you show elders in the communities this, and they don't ask, well, why aren't the guy's kids shown on here? They don't ask that because they know, well, that's another house. This is Wilps Neist. Everyone on here on this sheet of paper is a member of Wilps Neist, plus also included are the men who married in or who are the spouses or fathers of members. And uh, their, uh, the houses that their members of are represented fully on other charts. So this is just one of a series of charts. But many times people who, who are not from the communities or who are just learning about their own culture, they'll look at it and they'll say, why aren't my brother's kids on there? I get that question all the time. And I say, because they are part of their mother's house. They're on another chart. And um, you know, I can show you that one too, but in, you know, and it's all part of a larger project. But the graphic representation is right there. So it's not a pyramid, it's a little bit of a pyramid, but it's not a complete pyramid. It, it often takes this kind of uh, rectangular shape, um, uh, uh, especially if the, uh, because the higher up you go on the page, the farther back the generation is. This represents, um, um, especially if the house has been maintained, it has a relatively stable uh, uh, population size, it becomes a kind of rectangle. And this becomes a very powerful way, a very powerful teaching tool for people who are just learning about their culture or who are just trying to get their heads around matrilineality. That they look at it and, and, and it immediately shows you, bang, these are the people in Wilps Neist. And anyone who's not shown here as, as a descendant is a member of another house. And this answers the question, uh, who has rights to a particular territory, who has rights to a particular set of hereditary names. Um, you have just one sheet of page, paper, one graphic representation that answers that central, that, 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 that central cultural question. And I want to, uh, and I have some other examples here of, uh, and for these particular examples, you know, the, in w one part of me, what I'd like to do is bring in a whole pile and binder of charts and so on and display them and so everyone can sort of see it. And in a sense, that would be nice, but in another sense, it would not be so nice because there are very important confidentiality issues that are involved with this kind of project. Um, and so, you know, and this conference is not, is, is not the context to have the entire project out in a room for um, uh, a, 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 a diverse pe group of people to um, uh, to sort of look through it, but I did ask and get and get permission from uh, uh, some families to put stuff on the on the uh, 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 overhead projector. This is, for example, um, a page from uh, the aforementioned Mary Jones's matrilineage. This is a uh, house of the Nehadi. Uh, of the Sanya Kwan. And uh, this is just part of it. It actually goes on to several 11 by 17 sheets of paper. It would be a very long uh, roll. And this sort of shows an example of, uh, uh, of the descent that's involved here. Uh, and again, I apologize. I, I did seek permission, but I know that um, there are other people at this conference who uh, have family connections with this chart as well. And I hope that no one's Made, been made uncomfortable by, by, by having this put up here. I also chose it because it's a family that I've worked closely with, so I feel fairly confident of the material. But notice in the upper right hand, the most important word in genealogy research, which is draft. So that you're never showing someone a piece of paper and saying, this is how it is, period. 
you're saying this is a draft, this is a work in progress, uh, comments are welcome if you see something, and every time I send out materials, when I'm authorized to send out materials, I have a cover letter that ends with, if you see any question, if you have any questions or see any corrections that need to be made or additions that need to be made, please contact me because there's no such thing as a final document in genealogy, even though sometimes you have to sort of pretend that it is. But it's always, it's always ongoing. And here you also see listed is uh, uh, some of the, maybe the focus could be a little better for that. Well, it's, um, at any rate, there's a very large number of types of sources that are used. And I want to spend some time talking about the kinds of sources that I used. And for people who are interested in researching their own Simsian Clinket or Haida genealogies, or who are interested in, in, in uh, uh, doing wider research at the community level, I want to go through some of the kinds of resources that, the resources that are available, both British Columbian and Alaskan resources. You have, and I usually put the oldest sources at the very top and some of the newest ones near the bottom. And here near the bottom, you'll see my colleague Judith Berman there. There's a chart that she worked on, very lengthy title for it, which also lists all of the uh, individuals who helped with that chart. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll be going through what some of these um, uh, uh, important kinds of information are. Uh, let's see. Uh, some major types of source material. So. Uh, first listed, you have ethnographic and historical. This is often the starting point, and I especially want to talk about these different sources of information in connection with uh, the sort of investigative aspect of so much genealogy. Many times when you're going into a uh, traditional community that has a lot of cultural continuity and has retained a lot of uh, 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 cultural knowledge, um, the work is made very easy for a researcher. Uh, you just uh, try to sit down with the most knowledgeable people and they'll tell you everything you want to know. Some communities are like that. Other communities uh, uh, are less like that. And in some communities, there has been uh, uh, a lot of loss of knowledge. And in communities, and for diaspora communities too, and where there has been a lot of loss of knowledge for particular families or community, then a genealogist has to become also a detective and has to look at different resources, not just to find out who are this person's ancestors, but how to piece together the question of what clan are these people? Because there are many Tsimsian, Clinket, and Haida people who are members of particular branches of the family that don't know what lineage they belong to, don't know what village they come from, don't know their clan or their house. They might know the major crest. They might say, I know I'm Raven or I know I'm Eagle. Maybe that's all they know. And so detective work is sometimes necessary. And that means bringing together a lot of different kinds of uh, 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 resources. And so ethnographic and historical information sometimes for many communities is very crucial. Um, is, there, is there anyone here who, who attended Mikey L. Askren's excellent presentation yesterday. Well, one of the uh, uh, sources that she worked with, the Viola Garfield field notes, and you saw a photograph of Viola Garfield if you were at that, at that presentation. Viola Garfield was an anthropologist, um, and even before she got into anthropology, she worked in the late 1920s as a school teacher in Metlakatla, Alaska, sort of fell in love with the culture, um, um, had an extremely positive experience there. That, that's what convinced her to go into anthropology. She later did a PhD working with Canadian Simsians. Her master's thesis was about uh, marriage customs in Metlakatla, Alaska. And for that work, she had these survey sheets which she brought to Metlakatla, Alaska. And as Mike Eel pointed out, she interviewed just about every family and uh, recorded traditional information about the uh, Simsian name, the clan that people belong to. And those few pages, you know, it's about this thick has a tremendous amount of information, which is of tremendous value to that community. And I've spent a lot of time using that um, uh, 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 in, uh, for kind of detective work. And I actually don't have an overhead that shows that particular material, but I do have some other illustrations of the kind of uh, uh, information that one sometimes has. And sometimes you have information of what the particular ancestor's hereditary name was. 
And then the question becomes, well, how does that help us figure out what lineage that person belonged to? So sometimes that requires other kinds of detective work. And the Tsimsian are extremely lucky because in the 1910s and 1920s, Marius Barbeau, who is a, a French-Canadian folklorist, uh, formed a partnership with William Bainan, who was a Tsimsian hereditary chief from Port Simpson, BC. And Bainan had been raised in Victoria, but got a quick education in his ancestral culture when he was called back to Port Simpson to uh, uh, assume a, a, a vacated chieftainship, and I know I have some relatives of William Bain in here. So I, I'm, uh, uh, and 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 he was 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 an amazing person in many ways. He's the he, he in many ways he he made as great a contribution to the recording of Timsian traditions as anybody, and he was very capable in terms of writing down the language. And he was uh, uh, had knowledge of the Gixan and Niska languages too, and he also knew what to ask. So it wasn't a case of an anthropologist going in and saying, "I'm interested in basketry," or "I'm interested in uh, the grammar of the language." So that's all I'm going to look at. It was a situation where the right people were there at the right time. Bainan said, "You know what? If you're going to be here, I'm going to tell you what the important stuff is, and I'm going to introduce you to the important people, because here's the really complicated information." that is uh, vanishing with the new generation that's coming up. The oral histories, the inventories of crests and hereditary names and the territorial rights of the different houses of the Tsimsian nation. That was the stuff that Bainan was worried might not be around in 50 years if it wasn't written down. So he said to Barbeau, if you don't want to waste your time here, then I'll, 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 I'll help you figure out what kind of stuff to record and was able to do it systematically uh, 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 as well. And so here actually um, is an example from the Barbo Bainan field notes. And as you can see, it's not that easy to read. Uh, Barbo went back and forth between shorthand and longhand sometimes. He used uh, a spelling system which was very specific to the way that anthropologists spelled uh, uh, native languages. And he had terrible handwriting. So, and he used to write on weird scraps of paper rather than nice notebooks. So you see these strange black borders on the sides. And I've spent a lot of time, many years, deciphering a lot of this. And I had training in the Tsimsian language from, from speakers uh, from, from Kitkatla and Lach Kualams and other, and, 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 and other communities. And that has helped me a lot in trying to decipher this. <clears throat> and what this is, is this is part of an inventory of hereditary names. You'll see some of those numbers, three, four, five. These represent the ranks of specific names that belong to specific uh, uh, lineages. <clears throat> and because Barbeau's material is so difficult, and because he didn't organize it, he interviewed people and then he sort of put it all in a big pile, folders that were numbered in the order in which he recorded it rather than any kind of, any other kind of order. Because of that, uh, Wilson Duff, who was, a rep who was an anthropologist who uh, uh, spent a lot of time, he spent about two solid years on a grant just going through Barbeau's material and organizing it in uh, a more logical way. <clears throat> So here you have uh, a page from Wilson Duff's notes. It's the same kind of information more uh, logically presented. So here at the top you have a Roman numeral which represents the rank of this particular house in the tribe, which is the Gitlan, the house of Woody Mass. And if I'm right, Mass is red cedar. Woody means like or resembling. Uh, and then in parentheses, Gisputwada, which is the Killerill clan. And then right below it in the second line, men's names. And there are the men's names in order by rank. Boys' names. There are the boys' names in order. So you went from that, those messy notes of Barbeau to this. And these Duff files are a tremendous resource for Tsimsian communities today. And sometimes, and they are, and they are used and consulted by villages on a, on, 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 on a, on a weekly basis. And sometimes it merely confirms information that's already being looked after and remembered and maintained in those communities. But sometimes this material is all that certain families have. And this is something that they have to go to when they want to start feasting again and start giving out names again. 
and this is also the information that I've sometimes had to use when trying to figure out what clan, what house does this particular family belong to. Because sometimes, you've all heard of William Duncan, uh, who was the missionary first at Port Simpson, BC, then at Old Metlakatla, BC, then at Metlakatla, Alaska. He baptized, or, or, or under his supervision, a very large number of Tsimsian people were baptized, including ancestors of Alaskan Tsimsian and of uh, uh, Canadian Tsimsian. And he is famous for the sort of hostility that he had towards the traditional culture and his feeling that potlatching was unhealthy and destructive to communities and so that everything associated with potlatching, including the hereditary naming system and the clan system, should be suppressed. Those were his feelings. But as he was baptizing people, he was recording their heathen name as, I mean, there's a, as his words for it, or rather not Duncan's words, but the words that are embossed in the pre-printed ledgers that were distributed by missionary societies and, and church societies at that time. So, uh, uh, so you have sex, heathen name, tribe, probable age, baptized name, date of baptism, by whom, and there you see Duncan was the uh, person performing the baptisms for some of them. And again, my apologies if anyone, if anyone recognizes a, a, an ancestor and feels, feels uncomfortable about having this up on the overhead. Please speak up if, if that is the case. Using those DUF files and those lists of names, you can do something that otherwise you might not be able to do, which is look at the heathen name, start to get an idea of how the missionaries were spelling certain sounds from the Tsimsian language, and then look for that name, and here it tells you what tribe it is too. You see a lot of them are Gitlan. Gitlan was the tribe that was the best represented of the nine Port, Simpsons tr Port Simpson tribes in the migration to Metlakatla, Alaska. <clears throat> you can go back, look it up and say, okay, this person, let's say Thomas on this first line, not only do we know what tribe he was, but, but it, since we know the hereditary name that he had, we can figure out what clan he was, what house he belonged to, and if he had a sister who has a lot of matrilineal descendants in the community who perhaps have not been looking after their names and their traditions, very often through no fault of their own, because that's, that's what happened through missionization, you can figure out what house this family belongs to. And I've had the honor of being able to do that for very many uh, Metlakatla families. There are still many mysteries from, from the perspective of this kind of research in the community. Uh, some families where I have to still tell those people, you know, we have not yet figured out what house uh, uh, you belong to. But there are many community, but there are many families where I have been able to let them know. And also very many communities, I want to I reiterate this because I'm very sensitive to the point that Mike Yale made yesterday, that people from Metlakatla uh, do not always appreciate the stereotype that Metlakatla is the place where they lost everything. Because there are families in the, uh, 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 in, the, in the Metlakatla community uh, where people never forgot what house they belonged to and, and never stopped handing down their names. And we have some uh, people from Metlakatla today, uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but Stan Marsden here, I remember, uh, the Tsimsian Tribal Council got communication from you that was handed over to me back in the 1990s. It's a little thing written down on a post-it uh, that was passed along to me which had the name of the house that you belonged to was information that you already knew, and that, that was information that had, not been, that had not been lost. So there was not total loss of information in Metlakatla by any means, um, and there are families that pass down names, but for those that for various reasons haven't, this kind of detective work can really um, uh, uh, make those connections. Uh, a question about a specific situation in Metlakatla where someone is is, is at the moment in the process of preparing to take a name. And what I was answering was that um, uh, 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 I'd rather not get into specific cases. I, I'm in touch with a lot of Metlakatla families and I know who that is. Um, um, and, and, and without saying much more about that, that is a very important example of the kind of thing that many people in the Metlakatla community uh, uh, are involved in doing uh, or, or, or would like to be involved in doing. And that's also connected uh, with uh, the other question, Wilma's question about um, how do I find out what 
my hereditary name is. And even the way that, the, and even the way that question was asked uh, is, is, is really a great insight into the kind of uh, powerful kind of identity that hereditary names are. <clears throat> because many people who don't have hereditary names express to me uh, a feeling uh, that there is somewhere a hereditary name that belongs to them, to him or her, and that uh, uh, is there, and that it's a question of, and that it's a question of reconnecting. And the way that the Tsimsian naming system works, and this is this is all, uh, this sort of addresses both of those questions, is that names don't belong to people inevitably. When names uh, uh, are established upon people, when people assume names or get names, however you want to phrase it, uh, it's something that happens because of uh, a process, because of a, a political process and a very complicated protocol that sometimes, that sometimes takes years. And sometimes that is a political process, and here I'm talking about traditional politics, family politics. Sometimes this is a political process that involves hard feelings and involves disagreements, but the traditional system has ways of resolving some of those differences, which involve the respect for the authority of the elders and the house and the clan leaders, and also involve the uh, principle of consensus, that things have to be uh, uh, worked out. And sometimes this is, these are very long, painstaking uh, 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 processes. And, <clears throat> and, and some very uh, interesting questions arise, which I don't have full answers to. When you have a situation that was never anticipated in the, in the, in the original traditional culture. The original traditional culture was designed to operate in a system where there was continuity and where knowledge was transmitted from one generation to the next and where the younger generation was always trained in protocols. It was designed not uh, uh, knowing that colonization would occur, that missionization would occur, that uh, 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 boarding schools and residential schools would occur. Those uh, historical phenomena were not anticipated by the traditional system. So the traditional system has wonderful, coherent answers to questions such as who should become chief when a chief passes away? Well, the older people in that clan get together, they look at the, and this works slightly different for you, differently in, in Clinket and Simsian communities, so I'm, I'm, I'm describing more a Simsian situation, um, although there are many similarities as well. You, you, you look at the leadership qualities that might be in the next generation comes up. Well, first you look at who is in the house, which is something that's, an, that's sort of an automatic knowledge where you have a lot of continuity. Who are the people who might be candidates? Who is the oldest sister's oldest son? Uh, if that person is not in the community or is not capable for whatever reason of taking the name, who's the next person you go to? There's a whole protocol where the elders of the lineage get together and discuss things and also consult with other members of the same clan from other lineages. There's a whole protocol that's in place. So the traditional culture has wonderful coherent answers for what happens in a situation of continuity when a chief dies, for example. But what if you have a situation where there have been residential schools, there's been missionization, there have been people who have been beaten for speaking their own language in the schools. There are people who have been dispersed to different communities, um, um, where there are people who have uh, 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 and, and all the other sorts of things that happen. Then you have another set of questions such as, what if a house has members in it, but no one has held a hereditary name in that house for living memory? No one even knows who the last chief of the house was. What's the procedure for how to get the name started going again? Who becomes the next chief? Well, the traditional culture does not have a specific answer to that question. And it's something that communities have had to work out for themselves. And there have been missteps, and there have been disagreements, and there have been uh, very fruitful conversations along that journey of trying to figure out how do we regenerate a system that's in disuse. And very often people ask me, well, well what do you do? And I try to be very careful not to say, well, this is what you should do, or that guy looks like he should be, <laughs> you know, that's not my job. But, um, I would say just in the broadest possible terms, 
that it has to be uh, a conversation that occurs in the leadership of that of that particular matrilineal family, and many and 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 many people who are members of houses that are in a situation like that don't think when I first bring up that phrase that they have a house leadership because they might not have people holding hereditary names. But very often they'll think about it and they realize that they do have a house leadership. Well, yeah, you know, my aunt is the person that everyone always goes to for advice about such and such. So sometimes there is a house leadership even if the people aren't holding hereditary names. But there's no simple answer to a question like that. And one of the most rewarding things about this work that I've done is that I'm putting together information in a way that starts those conversations where people get together and say, boy, I just found out that we're in the house of so-and-so. Wouldn't it be great if we could get our names going again? And the most amazing thing about a situation like that is nobody else in the world has rights to those names except the people in that extended family. So um, although the assumption of a name is something that ideally is done with the recognition of, 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 of houses that you're related to by marriage and other houses in the community. Um, in a sense, it's, there is, it, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity to start from scratch. And when we have name lists, that can be a very powerful thing. People take the name lists and say, well, let's start having a conversation about it. And the way that Simsian feast politics usually uh, are carried out it takes years, um, and people from the non-native world are sometimes astounded at the number of years that it sometimes takes for people to work out a decision like this. Because if you go forward with a decision like this and half the people in the family are against it, there's going to be trouble down the road. Uh, which is not to say that that hasn't sometimes happened, but that's a reason for taking things very slowly. So that's, I mean, that's a very important question because in a way, uh, for certain families, that's that's uh, uh, that's what this is. That's what this is all about. Um, and we can have more conversations afterwards about this. We're getting to three. I think we're gonna. And then there's a half hour break, and we might run a little bit over. But what I want to get to also is more of the different kinds of resources that are available, especially for those of you who might be uh, carrying on this research. So I've gone through some of the anthropological resources. There are also some that are available in other areas. Just to start with really easy ones that are online. Who has encountered Lee's Obsession? Uh, which is run by, uh, this is a sort of area of rootsweb.com, which is a, a uh, non-subscription, that means free website that you can go to, where people can deposit their own GEDCOM files, which are a way uh, of, of which is a format of genealogy database and be able to make it publicly available. And Kenneth Lee, who I've never met face to face, is uh, uh, married to a Tsimsian. He's non-native, but he began doing, uh, began with his wife's genealogy and he's, he, he is a, uh, an avid genealogy hobbyist. And what he ended up doing is taking a lot of the publicly available sources and, and, uh, uh, and putting together an incredible amount of genealogical material. When I started, when I first started doing genealogy research with Metlakatla, I sort of said to myself, oh no, one of the things I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to find a, a box, a big tray of microfilm rolls of the Ketchikan Daily News back to their founding, and I'm gonna have to scroll through every page on one of those microfilm readers that makes you seasick so that I can find every obituary. And then I learned that I didn't have to do that because Ken Lee already did that. And he already put it into a database and has also looked at censuses and church records and has also talked to living people. And I want to emphasize that one thing that he makes sure of <clears throat> is that information on living people is not in uh, uh, the database as it's available online. So you'll, if it's someone whose children are alive, you'll see the entry and the children will be listed. It'll just say living, 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 and you click on it and nothing happens. So the information on living people is not there. And that's for reasons of confidentiality and sensitivity. And I even know of one incident where there was an individual who was using this website and learned, because sometimes he reproduces the text of the entire obituary, learned something that she didn't know, which was the cause of death of a relative of hers, but it was in the obituary. And that was a very painful uh, way for her to learn that. 
and she talked to Ken Lee, and he took that information right off the web because he doesn't, you know. So, 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 so he's 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 approaching it as 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 far as my understanding, it is from a very uh, 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 way that's sensitive to the communities, and um, so that's one resource, and it has some errors in it. My work does too. Every uh, every every body of genealogical data has errors, but this is a great place to start because it covers Metlakatla especially well, but also covers all of the native communities in Ketchikan, and he's adding uh, BIA censuses from Heidelberg and Klawak, and so it's expanding to, in, uh, and, and Kassan, and it's expanding to include other communities as well. So if you're interested, for example, in Heidelberg genealogy, one thing you could do is try to get a hold of the Bureau of Indian Affairs censuses, which they would do every few years for a community. Well, because of uh, Ken Lee's website, if, if you're going far back enough so that it's not living people, that, inf that, that information is there. So that's one resource I wanted to let you know about. Another one, and some of these are on the handout. I list some of the websites, and the handouts are at the back of the room. Uh, for people whose ancestry involves British Columbia, British Columbia has done something which Alaska has not yet done, which is not only is there a way to order marriage certificates, birth certificates, and death certificates after a certain amount of time has passed, but you can, um, oh, that's not this, but you can, uh, uh, but, but you can search for them online too. So if you go to B, and on my handout I have the website for that, you can go to BC, the BC Archives website, and you can type in a, the, the surname that you're interested in, or the first name, or the, or the range of dates, and you won't get the reproduction of the vital statistics document, but you'll get a pretty good description of what it is, the name of the bride and groom if it's a marriage certificate and the date and place. And then you can order it and get the full text if you want. But you still learn a lot just from browsing the index. The Alaska, the equivalent in Alaska, is the Department of Health, the State Department of Health has, uh, uh, the Bureau of Vital Statistics in Alaska is part of the Department of Health. And in their website, there's a place, and that's also on the handout, where you can order vital statistics documents, but you can't search it online. So what you do is you have to send in an order form and hope that they have it and wait till you hear back. Um, so, there's, so, often there's, so often there's quite a lag time. Another thing for British Columbia is that the Census of Canada is available online in various forms. And the one that's really available online is the 1911 Census. Uh, for, British, for, for First Nations communities in British Columbia, you have the 1881 census, the 1891 census, and then the sad fact, they do them every 10 years after the round number, so it's uh, um, decade plus one. The 1901 census for Canada, the Indian agencies for the North Pacific Coast are missing. So we have no idea, as far as the census is concerned, who lived in these, in these villages in 1901. But 1891 is there, and 1911 is there, and 1911 is online. You can go at it and look at every page and zoom in and zoom out. This is an example of, uh, of, of what it looks like. And sometimes it's, it's devilishly hard to read, but if you have some knowledge of the community, then, it, then that can help you with the handwriting. So that first surname here, that just looks like a smudge unless you know that Port Simpson is full of Morrisons, and then you can figure out that that's, that, that says Morrison. Uh, and, um, and that's searchable. And a little tip on that one is that a lot of the Simpson communities are hidden in, uh, under the NAS Indian Agency. You'd think that would just be the NISCA, but, but, but uh, Port Simpson, Port Essington, and uh, uh, Old Metlakatla are under NAS Indian Agency for those researching that. And again, um, U.S. censuses are also available online, but as far as I know, they're not online for free anywhere. But there is something called Ancestry.com, where you can um, get a two-week free trial membership, and then you can look at all the U.S. censuses that exist with that membership. And then after two weeks, they cut you off, and you have to start paying something like 20 bucks a month. So it's very much like the crack and heroin dealers when they're trying to get someone hooked. They'll give you your first batch for free, and then they start charging you. And for those of you who have become addicted to genealogy, you'll appreciate the analogy, even though it's much healthier. Um, but what a lot of people don't know 
is that even though you only have two weeks for free to use Ancestry.com, your public library probably has a subscription to Ancestry.com, so you could go to your public library, type in their password, and there are all the U.S. censuses for you. Um, uh, um, and again, for, for the very south of the panhandle, Ken Lee has already organized a lot of this for the... Um, um, uh, has already organized a lot of this. And I want to just quickly also indicate another, s some of the um, uh, issues that arise. Uh, one of them is how to represent adoptions. Here is another family in Kitsum Kalem where I got permission to use this for the overhead. So you have matrilineal relationships, but the Tsimsian, and they do this a fair amount more than the Clinket do although the Clinket do some of this, which is adopting someone from one clan into another, or adopting someone that has no clan into a clan. Um, and in the case um, of, uh, here you have an example, you'll see the dotted line that goes down, and then it says N slash K for that woman there. N is non-native, uh, and K is killer whale, and the other W stands for wolf, and, um, uh, uh, and E stands for eagle, etc. So here's a woman who married into the community, and this is the traditional way that they do it in Simsian communities. If you're non-native and you're marrying into the community, then you get adopted by your new father-in-law and become your father-in-law's nephew or niece, matrilineal nephew or niece. Uh, that's the traditional way to handle someone without a clan that's marrying in. And so this is important to represent too, to use the dotted lines. So sometimes if per a person is being adopted from one clan into another, they'll show up as a house member on two different charts, and then their children will either show up on one chart or the other, depending on whether that specific adoption specified that the children would follow the mother in the new clan or not. Um, and this is something that something like Family Tree Maker couldn't even begin to handle. And that's the problem with um, uh, matrilineality also. Um, you know, the, um, and that's essentially why I don't use a database for my genealogy research uh, in the way that a lot of other genealogy projects do. And it's because if I used a database, then I would still be confronted with how do I print out what they call in genealogy software the report, the paper product, that people can look at and learn from. Um, there's no way to use any of the existing genealogy software to turn a database of names into a matrilineal chart. They can't do it. Some of them can tell you how to show people all of pe people who all have a last, the same last English last name, which is in a sense a patrilineage. So one way you could do it is lie to the database and tell them that the women are men and that the men are women. But then it's really hard to remember that all the time. And then sometimes these reports come out and saying son instead of daughter. And it's just, it's just a mess. You don't want to go there. Um, <clears throat> and then so, so really I've been in the position of sort of reinventing uh, the wheel in a way. Uh, these charts that I produce, and a lot of people see these and say, what's the program you use? I want to get that and do charts like that. And I say, I have really bad news for you. It's uh, just a regular draw program that you can get on uh, uh, Apple Works or Microsoft Office. But then each one of those circles and triangles and lines, you have to draw yourself with your, with your mouse and you know, reproduce them and distribute them. Because there's no program that will just spit this out. You have to draw it. And I've drawn over the course of the past more than 10 years or so, literally thousands of these charts uh, covering tens of thousands of individuals. The Tsimsian Nation, for example, has approximately between 75 and 100 houses, lineage houses, um, depending on how you count them. And each one of those has a chart, and in many cases they're on separate charts because there are relationships between the charts that we know must be there, but it goes back to per the period before documentation. So sometimes you might have a woman at the top of one chart, and that's the house of so-and-so, and then another chart, which we know is for, from various sources is the same house, but we don't know how the woman at the top of this chart and the woman at the top of this chart is, are, are connected. They might have been sisters, their mothers might have been sisters, so we keep them on separate charts until we learn that. And also, uh, some uh, 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 charts show 
non-native, matrilineally non-native lineages, as we sometimes call them, people descended from a non-native woman who was not adopted into a, into a particular clan group. Uh, so that some charts are that too, and some charts are unidentified as we learn more um, um, and branch out. So there are now thousands of charts covering some tens of thousands of individuals. And I don't want to run, one of the things I also wanted to talk about, just to address it quickly, is the issue of protocol. You have all this information, let's say you're a tribal organization or someone who's doing work on behalf of a tribal organization, then the question becomes, who gets this? You know, do you just deposit it in the community library or do you just uh, uh, make posters and plaster them all over town? Different communities answer that question in different ways. The Gitxan have an extremely strict protocol. You can look at your house's chart and you used to be able to look at your father's house's chart, but they even stopped that. So you can look at your own house's chart and that's it. And uh, uh, they're even a little bit prickly about making photocopies for people. The protocol that's developed in my work for the Kitsum Kalem Treaty Office and the Tsimsian Tribal Council and for the Tsimsian Genealogy Project, which is ongoing, continues those same protocols, uh, generally has it where we distribute to people charts that show charts that are charts of their house, charts that show that person's own ancestors or siblings or children. But I've sometimes had to be the bad guy and tell people that they can't have other charts because we have to sort of draw the line somewhere and have a strict protocol. Sometimes I get a phone call from someone who says, you know, the pe there's this other family in town and they're trying to do something really wrong uh, with their feasting. And I know that they don't really have a right to do such and such. And I want to prove it. So could you please send me a chart of their house? You know, and sometimes, sometimes I agree with that person's perspective. Sometimes I disagree. Sometimes I don't know enough about it to have an opinion. But I always have to say no. I have to say, I can show you your own ancestors, charts that show your own ancestors. I can show you your own house's charts but I can't show you some whole other family's charts. You can ask them uh, for a copy of their chart, but in the example of this conversation, it sounds like you don't get along with them too well, so they'll probably say no. <laughs> but I've had to be the bad guy sometimes, and, and sometimes I've had to be the bad guy for people who have really good intentions. I don't want to emphasize that. It's not all sniping. Sometimes people say, I want to help out a bunch of my neighbors because they want to get their name started up again, and so could you send me some charts of their families because they don't, you know, they don't email and they don't like to make long distance phone calls and so on and, you know, and, and sometimes I really know that person and I know that, that, that that's really all they want to do but I still have to say no because we have a protocol. But what I do is I say, you know, they can call me long distance if they, you know, can't afford, you know, and, you know, and, 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 you know, if they can't afford, you know, really to, you know, um, uh, 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 help cover the postage and, and, and photocopying, then, 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 you know, I can, I can help them out, you know. So I always try to help people out, but I've got to be asked by that particular person. I can't trust um, uh, that, that, that someone uh, uh, has the best intentions and they're asking about a whole other family's charts. And for each project, different protocols, different protocols have to be in place. I want to say that the Tsimsian Tribal Council no longer exists. And so the Tsimsian genealogy project lost its institutional home, but the hereditary chiefs that gave their mandate to the project never retracted that mandate. And I'm in touch with many of those hereditary chiefs. And with their um, uh, blessing, but unfortunately no longer with their financial support because there's no institutional context for that, the Tsimsian genealogy project is ongoing with some help from other, from other local institutions that the hereditary chiefs are closely connected with. And so I still do issue charts, but something I feel really bad about, I, I, I ask for nominal fees to cover postage and photocopying because otherwise it really starts to add up. But my time is donated for that, for that project. My time is also donated for the other project that I work on, which is the Kitsum Kalem genealogy project for the Kitsum Kalem Treaty Office. I have a different more uh, 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 intimate and uh, uh, relationship with that particular community. So I've always, um, um, uh, I, I, I've, al I've always been, been, been donating my time for them. 
Um, and there's some overlap between the two projects, but there are huge areas, huge areas of non-overlap. And my, um, uh, 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 as far as Cape Fox Corporation Genealogy Project, you've got to ask Irene, because I don't know where we are with that one yet. Um, although, as with everywhere, there's a lot of community interest in, in carrying that on. So, I have handouts at the back, and I have brochures at the back. And uh, uh, if you're interested in queries, if you're interested in getting a community-based genealogy project started, if you're interested in researching individual genealogy, or if you just have general questions about Simsian, Clinket, or Haida genealogy, about the tools for that, the resources, the methods, or, um, or, 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 or how to get started, then, then you can contact me, and my contact information is on that brochure. Are the people who are filtering in from the next uh, 3.30 session? Okay, so I think we're fine. Um, uh, we'll be sure to clear out of here by 3.30 on the dot, since we have the luxury of a little bit of time left. Um, so if people, wanna, if people still have questions, we can go to those. Judith? Um, I just have a question about genealogical sources for Southeast Alaska. First, I noticed that you put the Presbyterian Church down here. They have the Central Historical Society archives in Philadelphia. And one of the things that happened with the native churches and communities like San and... Um, Sitka, where they used to have a segregated church. When those churches were closed down, the um, baptismal records were sent back to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And Saxman also has a, 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 a church registry. And some of the churches that never closed down, like the Ketchikan Presbyterian Church, that still has its original registry from about 1900, 1905 is when they went out. Now, if you want to look at the one, for instance, I inquired because I thought that maybe you know, it might be possible to get a microphone made and brought here. The Sitka Native Presbyterian Church, which their baptismal record and it's got marriages and so forth. Um, I've never been able to see that one. I've seen some of the others, and they have very interesting information. On them. But it runs from about 1905 to when the church was integrated, about 1927. Um, you have to get the the local church here uh, to get to give permission um, for that to be microfilmed. If you go to Philadelphia, they will get it out of their vault, and you have to pay to get in the door at that archives. But they will get it out of the vault, and you can look at it there. But you can only get a microfilm here by getting your local church. And I don't quite know. Um, Willard Jones tried to get the one from Kassan, and um, the, the Southeast, whatever the organization is, never, you know, they never responded to him. So he was not able to get the microfilm. Now, as far as the US Census records are concerned, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about the 1900 census, for the U.S. census, the 1890 census was entirely destroyed in a fire in Washington, so it does not exist. But the 1900 census for Southeast Alaska, there were several communities where George Beck, who was a Presbyterian missionary, was the census taker. And um, he knew everybody's clan affiliations. And for instance, the census for Kuna for 1900, and I think the census for Angoon, and there could be one other community where he wrote down people's Clinket names and their clan affiliation. So um, you would have to have some means of connecting your um, ancestry to those names, but it's, they're really interesting documents because um, he took very he took his what he was doing pretty seriously. And I also understand that George Beck had larger files, but as to where those actually are now or what kind of, you know, I think they're still in his family's hands. <coughs> There's a lot of photographs and things like that. So there's somewhere in Southeast Alaska, I think, but I don't know anything about that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's and that's and that's well worth hearing. I knew a little bit of that, but not all of that. And that is one of the great barriers to doing research in Southeast Alaska is the difficulty of getting a hold of Presbyterian of Presbyterian church records. You know? Yeah. Are are you still planning on coming to Metlakatla, Alaska in August? I'd like to, but my summer is still in flux, and I can't say whether I'll get it out here or not. But, um, but yeah, several people, because there's, uh, there's a lot going on right around the same time, several dance groups celebrating, more than one dance group celebrating the anniversary, uh, Founders Day, and, some, and, that, and, and the big uh, cultural event. I've, I've been invited, but, but I, haven't, I haven't sorted out my summer yet. And also, my family has records of, that came from you that go back to where um, our family came from, 
Canada to Metlakatla, Alaska. Are we going to be able to get records that go further back than that? In some cases, yes. Uh, and, and here you're talking about when William Duncan was in Canada. Some of the individuals that he baptized were elders when he started baptizing people circa 1860. And some of those people were actually born in the late 18th century. So that's about as far back as it goes. What we don't have, and if some people earlier caught uh, Judith Berman's presentation about her work with some of the recorded genealogies for the Clinket uh, um, uh, people, one thing that we don't have for these Simpson communities is the kind of time depth of pre-contact uh, 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 pedigrees that you have for some of the Clinket communities. I'm not sure if that's um, uh, uh, because people weren't asking the right questions, they were asking different questions. But that time depth, it usually only goes two or three generations before English names. Sometimes that's, that's, that's definitely enough to make, to make a, 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 a house identification. Um, and it's different for different Simpson communities because uh, uh, the, 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 the people that Duncan baptized were some of the first Simpsons to have English names. Uh, uh, whereas in other communities it happened a little bit later, they were talking about circa 1860. An amazing thing is if you look at the census of Canada, you look at a community like Kitkatla, the 1881 census, there are a few people, the highest ranking chief who had English names, um, but otherwise every other family it's a Simpson name, no English names. 1891, everybody's got an English name. And one of the things that I been tearing my hair out trying to do is match family to family with the 1881 to the 1891 census. It's, it's not very hard. So in different communities, that transition happened at, at, at different periods. Uh, Kit Kapla, then that's, that's a very recent to make that transition. Um, and up in the Kits and Kale and Kitsilas area, it's also right around the 1880s and 1890s that English names came into full use. And how do you see your work impacting Metlakatla, Alaska? Well, um, so far it's been having an impact on a kind of family-to-family -family basis. And one of the things that's been very interesting is seeing how different families get different meanings out of the new information. Uh, uh, some, um, and, and also how, how, how some families take a lot of time mulling over this new information, you know, oh, we're the house of so-and-so, and then maybe sort of, um, uh, sort of chew on that information for a few years before it gels, if it does, into uh, a determination to use that information to perhaps regenerate a house. And some people are not interested in, 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 in uh, uh, regenerating houses, and some people are, and some people are interested in it, but they don't know what it entails. And one of the things that I'm able to do for some Metlakatla Alaska families, but not all, is to be able to find members of the same house in, for example, Port Simpson. For some Metlakatla Alaska houses, there are members of the same house on the Canadian side. For some, there aren't. Some exist only on the Canadian side, some exist only on the Alaskan side, some exist only on both. And when people are interested, Metlakatla people are interested, I say, well, you know, I could make some phone calls, and if the person is interested, I could uh, uh, put you in touch with the person who's your tribal chief or your house chief. And sometimes, you know, then I can step back and it's rolling, you know. Things, things start to happen without any further help on my part. And other times, there becomes more of a conversation that involves me where I'm directing people to written sources and living sources that can help them figure out the things that they want to figure out for what they, for what they want to do with that information. So I guess the shorter answer is a, a, a lot of different responses depending, depending on the family. Because that's one community where, although there are central offices that handle culture and heritage issues, and I've worked with some of the individuals in, in that capacity, such as Arnold Booth and, and Crystal Holt, that um, those research relationships are not always active and ongoing. So, 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 so the genealogy project does not have a very stable official presence in Metla Capital, Alaska. It's very much a family by family thing so far. Maybe that'll change. I'd, I'd love it if it, if it would. But, um.
My name is Alice Dundas, and I'm from Massachusetts, Alaska. Oh, okay. Stan Marston is my maternal uncle. This is my uncle Steve Marston. Yes, this we is my daughter met earlier. Audrey Hudson and Hi. her son Conrad Hudson Jr. Oh, and right. we'd like to thank you for the research that you've done on behalf of our family. Thank you for for and thank you and other Timson families for letting me be part of that. All right. I think we don't want to run into the next group's time. Are the people from the next panel here? Okay. Group? Oh. Do we want to have a few more questions? Okay. And then you can still start on time. How does that sound? Because it's 3.30, right? We need okay. to wrap it up. Oh, you, you need to wrap it up. Okay. For, for other logistical reasons, we have to wrap it up. But I'll be around in the building so I can continue to talk to people. Thank you very much.